Guys, what's going on? Welcome to Serial at Midnight. My name is Heath, and I am joined by Daniel Griffith, the man behind Ballyhoo Motion Pictures. Daniel, thanks so much for being here on Serial at Midnight. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Man, think people know your work from like you've you've been doing this for over 10 years. You've got behind the scenes features, you've got documentaries on so many movies. Your your features are on Blu-rays and DVDs. I've got a list here. I'm gonna read this. I'll I'll go fast. 10 years producing bonus features and documentaries um, on subjects including Universal Monsters, The Inner Sanctum, Hammer Films, This Island Earth, Waterworld, which is one of my favorites, Donnie Darko, Streets of Fire, Horror Express, The Films of Anthony Mann, The Twilight Zone, The Twisted Worlds of Charles Band, uh, The Swampy Exploitation of William Greffe, The Excess of Karolko, this one right here, uh, Rock and Roll High School, Dark Knight of the Scarecrow, John Carpenter's Dark Star, and Mystery Science Theater 3000 quite a resume and that's not even all of it that's just the tip of the iceberg it's it's really an honor being a um being a cinephile all my life uh, loving movies uh i i mean it's it's an honor to meet these people it's an honor to discuss their work and um and it certainly is an honor to be that portal in which that work is preserved and and um and and really discussed uh, out there and uh in the the world of the, I would say like, I would say fandom in general. Most of the stuff I deal with is um, is really coming off of of a certain type of uh, certain type of fandom. So um, right, it's, it's always interesting. A lot of genre stuff, right? Like it tends to fall into the genre category. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it, it's strange because I love I love cinema as a whole. I I'm a fan of you know every aspect of cinema. So. Yeah, you know, I really didn't enter this, you know, focusing on one genre. I really entered it, you know, trying to find a subject matter that no one, no one had explored before. Something that I thought was in danger of being lost, um, and and that was my my goal. Really, just entering in, uh, doing this type of work. Uh, it wasn't to do bonus features. I was a fan of you know, added value content that was produced by, I mean, really just a number of, of great filmmakers. Um, mm -hmm. But, uh, but I never really thought I, I want to do that. That's what I want to do as a profession. Um, I really entered in the realm of making documentaries just because I'd been writing scripts and trying to get my friends to show up on, you know, on Friday night and Saturdays to make little low budget indie short films and I got so exhausted having to wear all the hats because most of the time people wouldn't show up or half of your crew would show up or one of your cast members wouldn't show up something would happen because everybody's just doing this for free it's all a passion for everyone we're sharing in this passion but you know our our, our lives do take precedence um, you know things in our lives whether it's a job or family or and I thought to myself you know, I have been a fan of documentaries all my life, uh, not just film related documentaries, but just documentaries in general. Um, I grew up actually being a, a just a big fan of In Search Of. In Search Of was one of my favorite things to watch. With when the I was Leonard Nimoy. With Leonard Nimoy, yeah. And, uh, yeah. and so I loved The Supernatural and I loved documentaries exploited The Supernatural, but I also loved, I love film history and um, and it just sort of hit me uh, I was, I was watching a mystery science theater episode and I saw the name K Gordon Murray come up as a K Gordon Murray presents. Uh, and, and I remembered that his name came up when I was a kid watching late night, uh, like local broadcasted, um, uh, sort of like a late night, uh, horror show. There wasn't a host. Uh, it just, it was just a, program that played cult movies mm -hmm. and i remembered every holiday they played santa claus which was this um i didn't know at the time but it was an imported uh mexican um uh holiday film and it was made in 1959 and as a kid i was sort of transfixed by this film uh the the imagery just would never go away uh it was it would haunt me and it was it was not that the movie was good Right. It was just so surreal. And I, I thought I would love to know what was going through the minds of the filmmakers. 
fast forwarding uh, to uh, uh, my, my early twenties, I'm in, I'm in school and um, you know, I'm, I'm a projectionist at a movie theater and, and I, uh, I decided, you know, Hey, uh, K. Gordon Murray, who's this guy? So I started looking into who this person was and, um, and I, I think it just, it just hit me. I was like, you know, that's a, that would be a weird subject for a documentary. And that's something no one's ever going to touch. No one's ever going to do anything on K. Gordon Murray. Um, so I, I decided, you know, I'm just going to do it. I'm going to do a documentary. I have no experience making documentaries. I just watched them. That's that I grew up watching them, but I've made some short films and, I've been practicing editing and uh, and how to build a narrative and everything else. And, uh, and I thought, well, with a documentary, I don't have to rely on anyone but myself. Uh, I, you know, I could be my own crew. I could travel and film interviews and, and, uh, and that's what I did. I, I just on my own time uh, on my days off and took, took vacation time to travel to different places. I just reached out I uh, found these, I had to do a lot of detective work finding these people, but I interviewed all these people that, that K. Gordon Murray, this distributor from the, um, the 50s and 60s, um, I just found the people he surrounded himself with and was able to cobble together the story. And as I was making that documentary, that's when I was reached out to this new company, new company uh, called Shout Factory, we're uh, licensing the library of mystery science theater titles. I've and, never heard of that company before. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it, they, it's, it's, it's a niche small, company. Right? Yeah. yeah, it's small. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think that when they first reached out to me, they were interested in licensing that documentary for okay. one of the MST sets, and I was like, "Well, this isn't like a bonus feature. This is a documentary. I, I, I don't want to put it on as a as a, a an addition to or an extra. Yeah. I would rather it be the focus." Um, uh, that brings me to something that's always hard to do when you spend so much time making documentaries as added value content for something, even if you put your heart and soul into something and it's epic, it's long, it's filled with all this material, you know, it's still secondary to the feature. So when people talk about it, when they review it or whatever, what you hope is people watch your documentary, especially when it's a feature length documentary, you're hoping people watch this documentary and, and analyze it and discuss it. And like, you know, like you would the film itself, but, in, in, but it, most of the time it's just a footnote to the review. It's like, uh, you know, paragraph after paragraph talking about the movie in which yeah. this is featured on. And you get to the bonus features. There's like, if you're lucky, there's this great documentary about the making of it. There's also a trailer. There's also a still, and it's like, oh, I did, yeah, yeah. I did months of work on this. And it's like, it, and it comes down to a line and a review. <laughs> but yeah. anyway, I, dig I digress. Um, uh, we'll but then that's what, that. that's what led to me working, doing mystery science theater bonus features. And that's kind of, that's kind of something that got me started. And that, and that grew into, me doing work for early in the early days, I, you know, doing work for uh, VCI, uh, which is great, you know, company. Really, one of the first one. I say one of the first home uh, home media distribution companies. It's certainly one of the last that exist. I mean, you could almost say, you know, Charles Band, you know, is closest to the first that's still in existence, but his brand has changed you know throughout the years mm -hmm. um vci the brand really hasn't changed the name or anything it's vci if you go back to the late 70s and look at like you know the the early vhs market yeah vci exists i understand but and as you're you've opened a lot of doors here and i want to explore some of these um you, your comments about how these end up being considered bonus features on right you know, supplementary material when for you and frankly for me too, like they're not supple, like they're <laughs> the Waterworld documentary is as good, if not maybe better than Waterworld. Like it's this whole, the narrative that you're able to, to, to tell they're talking. I mean, there are things in that I, I didn't even know anything about some of this stuff and that's having come of age during Waterworld. Like I was following that when it was made, 
but they're like i i think it comes out in that documentary um i've, I've got it guys if you if you want to find it it's it's here in the arrow water world uh set but like costner maybe taking over things and taking control of that project i was like oh, i didn't know this um and it's long too. It's about it's 90 minutes or so, isn't it? I, if I remember correctly, it's, uh, it's 100. It's 100 minutes. 100 minutes. Okay. No. I feel like special features are less important to the mainstream audience. And so they can often be overlooked. But what you're doing is you're putting so much um, journalism. That's, I think that's the real word, the storytelling, the journalism of how these movies are made. How has these mainstream industry shifts, how have they changed? the way that you do your work, you know? I don't know. I mean, I, I, I mean, because I don't deal with major studios so often, I mean, I, I, I deal with them, uh, I would say on a, on a more um, ancillary basis. <laughs> it's, it's not necessarily something that I have much experience with. Uh, when I deal with studios, it's always through, a, you know, a sub distributor, you know, right. so like Arrow, uh, like dealing with Universal through Arrow or dealing with Shout through Arrow or de dealing with Universal through Shout or someone like that. Um, you know, it's interesting because, I mean, you're being very kind about uh, like journalistic integrity and, and being able to build these narratives. But I mean, everything kind of falls into what you can get and how far you can take it. Um, Waterworld you know, it is just something that it drives me nuts, but I do understand where people are coming from when they review these things. They're like, why didn't they get Kevin Costner? I guess they couldn't get Kevin Costner. And it's like, well, it's not that easy. I, um, uh, with Waterworld, which, by the way, you know, I've said this multiple times, certainly in social media. You know, there are 10 films that if I made documentaries about these 10 films, I could stop. I could be done. I, I would have, I would have accomplished goals in my life that, that, I, I, that I never thought that I would accomplish. And these goals stretch back with Waterworld. You know, that was my, um, that was my senior year, high school summer. Um, it, it was a movie I followed long before the film came out. Um, working in a movie theater, you have like access to box office magazine and all these other periodicals that give you updates on things that are going on that are in production. And, I remember the teaser trailer. Uh, I remember attaching it for the first time ever watching it. Probably most people seeing the trailer because you didn't have internet at the time that you could just watch trailers. Um, the teaser trailer for Waterworld was attached to uh, Street Fighter, the, the Jean-Claude Van Damme, uh, Raul Julia film, um, which I did special features for and I'm doing that now. Um, uh, when I saw that teaser trailer, I was just... I was awestruck by how cool this was. The concept of like really Mad Max on water, you know, I just thought it was awesome. I mean, I, I loved post-apocalyptic films, especially when I was uh, when I was younger. And um, I really responded to it. I followed the making of that film as much as I could. And, and I knew that if I ever had the opportunity that I would do something about the making of that film. And uh, as I started doing documentaries, it became a part of this list of 10 movies that I wanted to make documentaries about before I died. And in that list, um, I've, I've been able to do four of them. But with Waterworld, you know, I did try to get Kevin Costner. I dealt with his, yeah. uh, his personal assistant, as a matter of fact. It really came down to scheduling and money, um, you know, uh, according to his assistant, whether this information reached Kevin Costner or not, and if it was just a wall that I had to kind of break through and the, and the, the wrecking ball that I needed to break through that wall was, you know, strapped with a lot of cash, you know, so I had to like mm -hmm. give a number to see if that number would break that wall. And I would actually get to the other side where Kevin Costner is there going, I didn't even know you were making a documentary about Waterworld. I'd love to talk about Waterworld. Um, you run into that a lot. Uh, and most of the time, these people are coming from dealing with studios where when they did sit down to do an interview, 
for something that had already been previously released, there were um, there was money. There was money involved. I mean, they would they would be uh, compensated financially. And in, in these cases, you're dealing with such a small budget. You know, you do compensate. You know, actors on occasion. Uh, it's difficult. It's a difficult proposition, and you know, especially if they're busy. And especially if they're in areas where you can't get to them at the time he was working on Yellowstone and, um, and mm -hmm. I, 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 you know, just to show my dedication to get him in this documentary and, and recognizing how important it would be to have him in this documentary. I, I, I said, look, I will, I will fly to where you are. I will, I will show up where you want me to show up. I will be ready at the time you want me to be ready. And you just have to give me 30 minutes of your time. But, you know, whether or not that information got directly to him yeah. or if it was just, you know, held at bay from this uh, assistant I was dealing with, you know, I'll never know. Um, uh, but uh, but still, I, 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 I'm proud of the documentary for Waterworld, considering that it, it landed in my lap with a very tight budget and a very short production window. I mean, it was, um, really? I had, from when I was approached, I had about three months. Whoa. Yeah. You know, so, um, so it was a quick, it was a quick thing. And I'm the one that fought. I mean, it wouldn't have been a feature documentary. Yeah. You know, this is arrow coming to me after the previous producer attached to it was getting nowhere came to me and said, you know, do you want to take on Waterworld? Uh, because they had originally offered it to me, but then reneged it because they realized they'd offered it to another producer to do the extras. And I was, at first I was excited. I was like, oh my God, this is a dream come true. I get to do the, do what I wanted to always do, which is a documentary about Waterworld. And they quickly came back and said, scratch that. Uh, you can't Heartbreak. Do oh, I, um, you know, yeah, it's like, but we'll give you, uh, you know, killer clowns from outer space. Um, uh, but, um, but, but then they came back and said, okay, you're getting nowhere. See what you can do. And I had already been in touch with different people associated with the film just because I wanted to know it was, it was something I was interested in. And um, so then, you know, I quickly went to work. I had a lot of convincing that I had to do. I had to, I had to convince a lot of people that were involved that I wanted to celebrate the making of the film. And I wanted to kind of cut through a lot of the bad press that it had uh, and kind of get into why it had the bad press that it had, mm -hmm. you know, which is, it's interesting because when people reviewed the documentary, the two things that they, they, that I guess would be considered negatives were the lack of cast and that, you know, I, I approached all the cast members. Um, uh, all of them said, no, uh, uh, they didn't want to revisit their time you know, making that film. Um, you know, I had to, had to tell this story in a way that was trying to cut through to the truth of the story. And because I went that direction, I didn't sensationalize aspects of it. And so when people watched it, they're like, but what about all those stories we heard? And I was like, well, the documentary is telling you that 90% of those stories are just bullshit. And, and, but, you know, I didn't include the bullshit because that's not what I wanted to include. Yeah. You know, I did make references several times through the interviews that that's just not true or that's not true or that's not true. Um, but people were looking for the dirt that they always heard about. And then when they watched it, they didn't get the, they didn't get all that tabloid fluff that they thought they were going to get. And that that made it a negative on the documentary, which I thought was kind of interesting because I was like the whole point was to to illustrate how that fluff. Yeah. Is just what it is. It's air. It, it's you know, it, it's an interesting situation when you have journalists that are kind of cut out of the they're kind of cut out of the loop. And therefore, you know, they're going to find ways to get stories no matter what. If we have to hang, hang out in a hotel bar and listen to a bunch of drunk, disgruntled uh, uh, crew members talking about all the stuff that's going on that day, yeah, that's what they're going to do. 
I mean, I can't imagine anybody be like, but where's the dirt? I mean, there is dirt there. There's enough right. real dirt that you don't have to manufacture dirt. Like it's a really interesting story. Well, it's, and it's compromised. I mean, it's not, it, you know, there's nothing that I have done that I've taken it as far as it can go. Yeah. It's always, we're always up against a deadline, which I'm notorious for uh, pushing. Uh, I, 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 it drives, it drives distributors crazy. Um, and I try not to do it. And it's not a time management thing. It's more of a perfection thing. Uh, yeah. I want to take it as far as I can humanly take it, you know, you know, give me a little bit more time. I can take it further. Give me a little bit more time. I can take it further. Um, I push for that. Doesn't make me a lot of friends. Um, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but I, I do it because I absolutely love the films or I love the story associated with the film. Sometimes mm -hmm. I can't stand the movie, but I love the story behind it. Um, so, so I, I do that, uh, but, but every, every project is, is, you know, it's compromised by something. Uh, and usually right at the beginning, there's not enough money, you know, there's not enough time. Uh, but I try to push it as long as I can. I mean, just, you know, jumping forward here, but being more contemporary I, uh, on the release of Total Recall, the 4K release. Um, uh, so the, um, the, uh, the Carol Co documentary, when Studio Canal approached me about it, and actually it's something I pitched to them before, um, they're like, hey, we're gonna do this. We think this is gonna be perfect for that documentary you pitched. And, and so, so everything was set to move forward uh, in December of last year. Um, so I was gonna have a lot of time. Uh, and I began in December uh, while I was filming material for uh, Inner Sanctum for Mill Creek and uh, um, and filming starting material on how to make a monster and war of the colossal beast for shout factory. I decided, well, I'll go ahead and squeeze in some of the interviews that I'll need for this, um, this Kelco documentary, because I, I want to, um, I want to make sure that I'm able to get as many interviews as possible. And I had, I mean, if you saw the roster of the people that I reached out to the people that I was going to get on camera for this it was pretty impressive, uh, and it would—it was going to be a big project for me, and and it wasn't necessarily going to be limited to the hour running time that it, it is now. Yeah. Um, but I, uh, you know, as I was filming the material in the beginning of the year, um, you know, we went into a pandemic, and um, and that changed what could be accomplished for for the project and it kind of came down to you know can you make it with the interviews that you have or can you find another way to get the interviews and i explored the possibility of doing audio based interviews but then i thought it would not marry with the fact that i already shot interviews with oliver stone or i have paul verhoven i've got all these other people mm -hmm. um so i i ended up deciding to you know, I contacted a friend of mine that I collaborate with a lot on these projects, uh, uh, a screenwriter, a great writer, screenwriter, historian, uh, C. Courtney Joyner. We, um, we great, started talking about, we started talking about, a, you know, how, how about doing a narration and uh, that, that would connect to be the connective tissue. And if somehow I'm able to travel during all this to get the other interviews, I'll be able to do it. It became more clear that people I wanted to interview I didn't want to jeopardize them and I didn't want to put them in danger for any reason. Um, but um, it became clear that it was going to be harder getting those interviews. Um, you know, uh, it was um, in the pre-production stage where I would typically travel and film interviews. Uh, things were kind of a roller coaster of, uh, you know, numbers going up, numbers going down, numbers going up, numbers going down, um, concerns going up and down, same. Uh, so, I, uh, I, you know, I worked with Courtney, Courtney, you know, basically batted out pretty, pretty quickly, this amazing script. And, and, uh, we had it narrated by, uh, by a really great actor, Larry Blameyer, um, who, uh, I think really rose to the challenge of doing something out of his wheelhouse. 
and um you got a lot of gravitas too uh, yeah and so so yeah so we we, we did this uh and uh um, you know, it had to be cut down significantly to get that hour mark. They ended up wanting that hour mark. So we oh. had to, we had to sort of reduce yeah. a lot of the story. So some of the meat dealing with certain films are, isn't there like it was originally. Mm. And, um, uh, uh, but I'm, I'm still proud of it, but, but I do see it as, um, you know, kind of an unfinished work. Mm. Uh, it's, it's not quite where I wanted it to be. And, um, and I would love to revisit the material and actually be able to film the interviews I wanted to film and still keep the narration. Um, uh, but, you know, but work in more interviews. Uh, I mean, that was the plan. It's the weird thing, right? It's that compromise because it is begging for at least two hours. I mean, it's a feature length documentary. It's in, in conception. And you've got all these movies that you're talking about. It could be so much longer, but on the other hand, it's got so much more meat to it and so much more weight than so many things of its of its kind. Well, and like, I mean, I'm going to be I'm going to I'm going to be watching this a lot. It has so much information in it. And it's just you know, we're also living in a in a environment where everything gets a documentary. Um, but sometimes the documentaries are, hey, remember so and so like, hey, remember the running man? Um but when you can talk to people, like I would never have guessed that you didn't get to talk to all the people that you wanted to, to talk to. I mean, there's so many interviews, you, like you say, you got Oliver Stone, Michael Douglas is talking. I mean, there's so many people, vintage um, press from Schwarzenegger and from, you got behind the scenes stuff of Stallone on the set of Rambo First Blood Part Two. I mean, there's just a lot of good stuff there. Um I think it's wonderful. I do want to say if this is kind of topical as we're releasing this video, but the total recall 4k did just come out like this week as we're recording this. And I watched this last night and I mean, I was so impressed. I'm always so impressed with your work. It's I, I understand your perfectionist tendencies, but you make stuff that's so much better than so much of what's out there. You don't have to answer. If you just want to say no comment, that's fine. Um, I'm curious as the industry changes, physical media becoming more, I mean, we have, Mainstream physical media interest is declining, but the boutique, for lack of a better word, um, representation seems to be growing. But the market isn't, it's in a change. And then we're making this with like a huge Warner Brothers announcement in the last few days. Do you see the opportunity for what you do being, um, how do you see the future? Do you feel optimistic about this in the future or do you feel like the window may be closing? Um. Yeah, it's always hard to say because, yeah. <laughs> you know, 10 years ago, people were saying this is out, this is going out the window. Um, if you look at trends, let's say, for instance, look at, uh, look at vinyl, you know, your vinyl's never really gone away, um, right. but now it's become kind of a thing again. And the, I think the reason why vinyls become a thing again is because um, people like the sound that they made, you know, the quality of sound is different. Um they like to see this great artwork representation of, you know, something, whether it's a soundtrack or um, if they want to see a larger representation of that original album cover that they they now have had to deal with for years as a reduced version on a CD. Um, um, they're, they're, I mean, there's different things that people are into and they, they want things that are tangible. I think we'll always want tangible things. Mm -hmm. I think we always want to build a library. Uh, I mean, if you look at how long books have been around um, and while people, you know, one would say people are, you know, reading more books on a tablet or on their iPad or, or whatever, that there's still people that buy books because they want to have a library. They want to go to a room in their house and pick something off the shelf. Yeah. And, um, and I, I think the best if you look at the look at the pandemic, we're all locked in. We're all watching you know, mainly, you know, either stuff from our own library or we're watching stuff that's being streamed. How many times just yourself have you been like, I want to watch summer school with Mark Harmon needs a Blu-ray. I, can't find, I yeah. can't find summer school on any streaming service. Um, there, there's, there doesn't exist. Right. You know, luckily summer school's 
one of my favorite movies growing up. So I, I, I have, I have it, you know, I have it on video and I have it on DVD in my yep. collection, but there, there are instances where, I mean, we're, we're nuts. We, we collect all the things that we love and we, we had like, you have this massive display of all your movies behind you. Um, I have a, a it's closet. all green screen. I have a closet. It's yeah. It's all green screen. <laughs> I have a closet of, uh, of, of movies, uh, you know, probably, couple thousand and uh and that's insane i mean for anyone i mean i you know i have neighbors that will like come in uh and like <laughs> look and they're like that there's something wrong with you they're like we have you to go we left the yeah, oven yeah, um, but but you know if i want to see one of my favorite movies yeah i know i can go to my closet and pull out uh the movie i want so well something that I know I'm trying to be efficient and also I have so many things I want to talk to you about. Like you talked to Joe Dante, Joe Dante is I, I've heard him say himself, you know, like he, he was a film collector when it was canisters of film and you have to store the, I mean, what a luxury that we have. We're like, Oh, it's $15 and I can have this movie forever. And like this excellent quality and I don't have to rewind it or maintain like a certain temperature or moisture level. I mean, what a luxury that we have. So it's interesting that we are still by some considered to be like the fringy, like, well, they're the movie kooky people. Um, right. But, but we're blessed in so many ways. Daniel, this has been a blast. Thank you so wow. much for the, your time. I'm so grateful for your time, for your experience and just uh, being honest and open with us here. Please tell people, we'll continue to talk about your, you know, all the stuff that you do here in videos, but tell people how they can follow you, your social media, where, you know, website, all that. Yeah, so I'm, 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 on, I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. Um, uh, Facebook uh, is uh, Ballyhoo Motion Pictures, and um, Twitter I think is Ballyhoo Films. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I mean, I have a website. You could always reach out to me. Just send me an email through the website if you have questions or or whatever. So awesome. Um, I'm out there. I'm not. Sometimes I'm so busy it doesn't seem like I'm out there. But uh, I think I've. You know, as, as most people probably have been uh, spending more time on social media through all of this, uh, I've been so um, busy, thankfully. Um, uh, I've been so busy that I haven't, I haven't been able to <laughs> interact as much as I'd want to on social media. Yeah. You're present though. You're always there and I appreciate it. So, wow. and guys, I'll put the links to those, uh, those social media outlets in the website. I'll put that in the description of this video so you can just click straight through and you won't have to go hunt for it. But uh, Daniel, thanks again so much. I really appreciate oh, you. Thank you. And you guys at home, thank you for your time. Uh, let's continue the conversation. Let's talk about the work itself. Let's talk about these documentaries, these behind the scenes features. Uh, thank you so much. Take care. And until next time, we will catch you later.